Good morning, happy Friday, and welcome inside historic Mr. Small's Theater in Millvale, Pennsylvania. I'm Matt Geica, and you're watching or listening to Geik's Got Game. I suppose you can do both at once. This is my weekly program going outside the box on Sports Talk Radio, or at least that's the goal, each and every Friday from 10 to 11 a.m., almost each and every Friday. I will not be with you next week, so this will be my final show of 2017. I'll be on the road in Michigan uh, dual business and pleasure trip. Penguins play the Red Wings on New Year's Eve, and also I'll be visiting family up in Grand Rapids. So uh, looking to savor the moment here in Pittsburgh with you this morning. And a reminder, you can be part of the conversation both on Facebook Live. Feel free to uh, throw a comment up if you're watching there. Or get after me on Twitter, Matt Geica, M-A-T-T-G-A-J. TKA. I'll endeavor to answer any kind of input or question or response you may have because I do have a couple of questions for you. I'm going to put you on the spot on this Friday morning. What's your sports story of 2017? I know that's rote, that's cliche, and normally I kill the cliche on Guy Scott Game, but I'm a sucker for the year end retrospective, like most of us are. Helps us pass time, doesn't it? It uh, gives us mileposts and reference points for the future when we look back at this year what's your most important your most impactful sports story or sports adjacent story it doesn't have to be necessarily a game or a moment or a championship on the field or the ice or the court it could be something that was cultural in addition to uh, having that impact in the world of sports as well our little toy department of the department store of life, if you will. Coming up later in this hour, Alan Saunders, my good friend, will make his regular appearance at 1020. We'll be talking baseball and hockey. Why baseball, you might ask? Well, the Pirates are being reported to be in heavy discussions with the New York Yankees to trade one of their core players. I'll get to that in a bit. And if you're on social media, if you're engaged with Pirates news, you already know who that is. Also, the Penguins, they have someone who's on the trading block, and he sat out what could have been a potential turning point victory for the defending champs on Thursday night at PPG Paints Arena against the Columbus Blue, Jack Blue Jackets. So that's coming up later in the program as well. I will give my tribute to a sports media, <coughs> excuse me, sports media legend who passed away yesterday at a ripe old age. He had a great life, but it's still sad to say that he is no longer with us, someone I really looked up to in this business and still look up to in this business and who I had the chance to at least shoot the crap with down in San Diego. That might give you a hint as to who that is. But enough teases. Let's get into the meat of today's show. And uh, again, it is interactive sports talk radio. So get after me on Facebook or Twitter and I'll do my best to clap back. This is the River's Edge, found at riversedgepgh.com. My sports story of 2017, boy, it's a, a tough call, as it always is, 12 months. And I think we're all capable of having some recency bias. The things that happened most recently are the ones that we tend to remember. But in this case, I believe the, uh, the final four months of 2017 held the prime candidates for a sports story of the year. And uh, one of them I'm representing on my t-shirt right now, Sin City Hockey, the Vegas Golden Knights. Quite the story. Off to the best start in the first half of a season in NHL history for an expansion team. But that's not the only reason why they're perhaps the top story. I'm not going to commit to them just yet as being number one. But think about it. The NHL goes into an untouched market in terms of major professional sports, and it appears to be a big hit. Hockey in the desert, there were questions as if we needed another hockey team in the desert, another NHL team in the desert, I should say. Of course, the Tucson Roadrunners play in the, uh, in the American Hockey League. You have teams, well, you've had teams in Arizona and Southern California, and you've had the Las Vegas Wranglers in the ECHL prior to the Vegas Golden Knights. But big-time professional sports in the entertainment capital of the world, you could call it, Las Vegas, Nevada. There was such trepidation from the sports leagues when this was first floated, say back in the 90s and early 2000s, would the proximity to the gambling capital of the world jeopardize the integrity of the games? I think we all know with internet gambling that there is no hiding from sports betting. So I'm glad that we as a sporting culture got past that. 
But I believe, as Lightning coach John Cooper said the other night, that the NHL getting into this market first was a coup, and it is uh, an innovative approach by the NHL. They thought outside the box. They didn't go to Seattle first, and of course, Seattle didn't get the building situation locked down until just this past week, and I think we will see a Seattle expansion team at some point. But the NHL didn't go to Seattle. They didn't go to Kansas City, which has been trying to get a, a major sports team for the winter time to go with the Chiefs and the Royals for years and years, as Penguins fans might remember from last decade, of course. They didn't go to Hamilton, Ontario. They didn't go to Quebec City, Quebec, cities that would have immediately embraced hockey, just like Winnipeg did when it got its jets back several years ago. They took a chance, and the Sun Belt expansion, the jury's still out on exactly how effective that will be in spreading the gospel of the sport and, well, just making it succeed in these markets. We've seen in Arizona, they've been yanked around with relocation rumors and a very bad team for most of their time in, in uh, well, it was Phoenix, now it's Glendale, um, out, uh, out at, what is it now, Talking Stick Arena? <laughs> yes, the, the names t tend to change over the passage of time. Florida, the Panthers, Again, not a lot of winning down there recently, and they have struggled at the gate. But then you have the Tampa Bay Lightning. You have, I think the Dallas Stars are a mild success, and they won a Stanley Cup in the late 90s, too, when they relocated from Minnesota. And you have the uh, Los Angeles Kings, multiple-time Stanley Cup winners now. The Anaheim Ducks won a cup. Not that I'm judging this by championships won, but the Ducks and the Hurricanes winning Stanley Cups back-to-back -back in the middle part of the previous decade. The Hurricanes are struggling now. The, the Ducks seem to have a fairly vibrant fan base, and it's been helped by their continued competitiveness well into this decade. Every market, save maybe Toronto and Montreal, and well, all the ones north of the border, I would say, are going to have attendance issues and attention issues, more pertinently, when they don't win. Uh, but I, I'm in favor of, I've said this before on this show, I'm in favor of expansion. I'm in favor of making these leagues bigger, it's easier to be a fan of a sport when you have a team to pull for in your area. I think geography still matters. I wouldn't have been as big of a hockey fan coming up if I didn't have the Penguins nearby to cheer for and, uh, and a very entertaining team to cheer for in the late 90s and early 2000s with the, uh, the Europeans led by Yarmir Yager and then the comeback of Mario Lemieux. So I'm not going to pretend that doesn't make a difference. Um, but just having a team in the area is, is big, and the Las Vegas market was untouched. It will get the Oakland Raiders, of course, of the NFL, but I see the NFL as being different. You have just 16 games a year, eight home games. When you have an NBA team, an NHL team, an MLB team, that becomes more the fabric of the culture more easily because there are more events, and Las Vegas being an event town, they really have embraced the arrival of Major League Sports. And then you had the tragedy, the mass shooting out in Las Vegas, and I don't know if you can say that the presence of the hockey team and its success on the ice immediately has helped meaningfully, tangibly in any way, but intangibly, it's given Vegas something to rally around, and I have relatives out there. I know that it's been um, you know, a big part of the healing process, whether it be insignificant in your eyes or significant in your eyes. It, uh, I think we should honor the people who say that it has helped out there to to get past that and, and to give Las Vegas undoubtedly something positive to talk about as they try to heal from the worst mass shooting in American history. So there are multiple aspects of it from the business standpoint, from the hype standpoint, and from, you know, for me, uh, a hockey supporter, a hockey evangelist, as I've called myself in the past, it's really cool to see a new market embrace that. But there is also, a, there's another story too, and uh, this one involving the NFL and players taking a knee, players protesting during the national anthem. It's hard to ignore that as a sports story in 2017, isn't it? And I know that's not all the way a sports story, but like I just said with the relation to the, the off-the-ice tragedy in Las Vegas, the Golden Knights aren't an all-sports story either. There is elements of, um, well, not just entertainment, but also real life issues there. And especially in the case of the NFL, there is an intersection with real life issues and politics with the president getting involved too. So when you think about 2017, I'm a hockey fan, so I might be biased toward the Vegas Golden Knights story, but I'm betting most of you out there, most of the sports fans, um, will be thinking about the NFL protests and perhaps the NFL 
not handling those protests very well from a league standpoint. I think eventually they got there with their commitment, their monetary commitment to social causes and full credit to the group of NFL players who pushed that. And full credit to Colin Kaepernick, who it appears has sacrificed his career. He has been blackballed by the NFL by any reasonable estimation. So give him big props, too. He took a stand or took a knee in this case. And it looks like he has totally shifted where his life was going. And I don't know if he intended it to be that way, but I'm betting he knew that there would be significant blowback when he started to do this at the beginning of last season. So it's almost a multi-year story, isn't it? 2016 into 2017. But overall, with apologies to the Golden State Warriors, with apologies to the Pittsburgh Penguins, to the Houston Astros, there's one too, another one where sports and real life comes together with the, the hurricane, Hurricane Harvey that crippled Houston and the Astros coming into prominence this year with an exciting young team that went all the way to the championship. These are all valid things to celebrate in 2017, but um, I'm betting if I had to make a call one way or the other, yes, the Golden Knights are up there. Yes, the Houston Astros are up there. But it's the NFL anthem protests and what that means to all of us. We all can look at the, the protests like an inkblot test, can't we? What does it mean to you? Does it mean disrespecting the flag? Does it mean... Uh, respect for the ideals upon which America was built. That's what the players are saying, of course. Uh, but I'm willing to take a look at people in the military, too, who say that it disrespects their sacrifices that they've made. There's so many ways to look at this. I think that we should, number one, honor the intent of the players who are sticking their necks out to make these protests. I think they're the ones to talk to first and foremost. But, of course, none of us can really account for for how all of us are going to react in, uh, in a nation that has become more polarized politically. I think that doesn't help either. Or it does help the, the hype machine, certainly. It gets people more fired up about it. And in some cases, it makes people want to tune out the NFL because they want to keep their sports world and their real world separate. And I've talked about on this show so many times. In fact, that's the principle upon which this show is built, that you can't keep sports in the real world separate. Just go back to the 60s and 70s, Muhammad Ali, that could have been your number one um, example. Jackie Robinson could have been your number one example as this nation fought through the civil rights era. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that Branch Rookie giving Jackie Robinson a chance with the Brooklyn Dodgers helped push along the civil rights era and help the perception of white Americans that minorities deserved equal rights and equal protection under the law just by seeing Jackie do his thing and be really good at it too. That didn't hurt. But to see Jackie do his thing on the field and be a part of the culture in that way too. So don't factor out sports. Sports is a big deal, folks. And that's why I've devoted my career to it. I believe it is a big deal. It brings communities together. In some cases, it can uh, tear cultures apart as well. It can make us all realize where we stand on certain issues. And don't just think of something divisive as being a negative. It can help to understand where people stand. And then we can perhaps make progress from there to bring things back together. But a lot of times you need to split before you can have a reunion. In fact, that does seem to be the, the case throughout human history. And I think we're seeing that with the way that all of us have approached and interpreted the NFL anthem protest. So I'm going to go ahead and put that one as number one as my top sports story of the year. What's yours? Be uh, interactive with the show. I'm inviting you in to make a comment. Let me know what you will remember, number one, about the world of sports in the year that is uh, running into its final nine days here as we uh, work our way down to New Year's Day. Thank you for listening to Geik's Got Game, and thank you for watching Geik's Got Game on Facebook Live and on RiversEdgePGH.com slash live. When I return, Alan Saunders will give me his sports story of the year. I sprung that one on him last minute. And also, we're going to talk about the fate of the two Coles in Pittsburgh, Garrett for the Pirates and Ian for the Penguins. What's their future? Their futures appear to be limited right now if uh, the trade reports are to be believed. This is the River's Edge. Hey, River's Edge listeners, Alex here from the Mike Sasson Show, and boy, have I got to tell you about Salon 22, a small local business located right here in Millville. I got my hair colored there about two weeks ago, and I still can't stop staring at myself. They use this awesome new technique called color melting to make me look like a mermaid. But don't worry, if mermaid hair isn't your thing, they'll meet all your hair goals. 
with things like balayage, rose gold, unicorn hair, ombre, as well as monochromatic color, which is your standard basic coloring. Seriously, they do it all and they do it good. Check Salon 22 out on Facebook and mention this ad when you make your appointment to receive a free color lock service to help preserve your color. It's a $20 value for free. I'm not kidding. Book your appointment now by calling 412-822-7222. That's 412-822-7222. Welcome back to Mr. Small's Theater. I am Matt Geica. Thank you for being tuned in to the River's Edge, riversedgepgh.com. It's a new kind of radio. I like to think this is a new kind of sports talk. This is Geik's Got Game coming to you every Friday morning from 10 to 11 a.m. And joining me on the other end of the phone line is my good friend Alan Saunders. We're going to talk about the sports story of 2017 as well as uh, the future of a couple of gentlemen here in Pittsburgh with the last name of coal alan good morning i guess that means that i'm gonna get coal for christmas uh yeah there was some sort of reference in there that i didn't have the energy to come up with this morning so <laughs> i'm glad that you delivered as i expected you to in that way <laughs> that's why i'm here right and that, that's it yeah for the for the wordplay for the expert wordplay no doubt about it well before i get into asking you your sports story of 2017 our good friend Dan Yost on Twitter chimed in. He says his sports story is down to these three things. Number one, uh, knowing Dan's soccer fandom, this doesn't surprise me. The U.S. fails to qualify for the World Cup. Yeah, that's up there, too. I should have mentioned that. That's in my top five, at least. Sports and politics coming head on. Yeah, that's what I mentioned in terms of the NFL anthem protest. So I think you can spin that into one story. And then also the shifting landscape of cable sports rights packages and how we consume live sports. I think just generally, TV and uh, the, the content producers of yesteryear are trying to adjust to the technology and how it's changed the way all of us consume anything um, in terms of our screens, the various screens that we have. But yeah, sports is at the forefront of that because sports was thought to be DVR proof, if you will, and it was thought to be cord cutting proof. I'm not sure that's actually the case, though, as we've seen trends and habits change in 2016 and 2017, and I'm sure even more into 2018. So, Alan, what's your sports story of the past year? Hmm. I, I don't think it's one story, but to me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting trend in that when you look at the NFL, the NHL, and the NBA, which are the three major league sports teams that um, give more than a token thought to competitive balance, mm -hmm. right? Those are sports leagues that in the last 20 years have become more and more um, places where, you know, the, the competitive balance is designed to make it hard to win year after year, right? That, that, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the draft picks or the salary cap or yep. distribution of, of revenues, those leagues have, have done, I've been at the forefront of, of making it possible for everyone to compete every year. And that's led to this sort of uh, time period where there's, there, there's been a lack of dominance. Hmm. Um, you, you know, it, it's just been too difficult to sustain it over the years. And in 2017, uh, the, the winners of those three leagues were the new England Patriots, the golden state warriors and the Pittsburgh Penguins who have won multiple championships this decade and have all proven that by doing things that you can think outside the box, you can uh, still amass talent, even in a salary cap league, even in a revenue sharing league. And I really think that those those organizations have proven that um, that those obstacles that we've put into place in order to make it hard for teams to be truly great on a multiple year. Uh, a look at things it's still possible hmm. and uh, i don't think that that's something that it almost kind of snuck up on me i don't think it's something that we've that we've talked about a, a whole ton but man i mean the warriors are the dominant team in the nba right now the penguins have been the dominant team in the nhl for two years you you look at what new england has done and it's pretty rare for those three leagues to have had, uh, I don't know if you, you want to call them a dynasty, uh, but certainly that type of dominance at the same time. And for it to happen right now, 
in the midst of this this salary cap revenue redistribution uh, hashtag trust the process <laughs> era. Yep, I think it's pretty impressive, and I, I think that that's uh, a big takeaway from what happened in sports this year. I wouldn't have gone with that one. So thank you for bringing something brand new to the table there. That is definitely a grand scheme type of a story, but it's true. It's true. These teams have figured out a way. And in the case of, well, the, uh, well, in the case of all three, they have the, the one or two in the case of the Penguins stars that, that lead the way, but that's not the only uh, ingredient you need to win in these eras and in this era or any era, you need a little bit more than that. You need a lot more than that. And they have, it seems like at least figured it out somewhat and done what the leagues are trying to prevent from happening. Now, uh, Alan, into the Pittsburgh milieu here, Garrett Cole, the first of our Coles on the discussion table today, Garrett Cole is involved in heavy discussions, according to Yahoo Sports, Jeff Passan and others now joining the party on that reporting. But he reported it last night that he believes the, uh, the move of Garrett Cole to the Yankees is a matter of when, not if. How do we get to this point? Because I felt like just a couple of weeks ago, the Pirates might stand pat. And when they didn't move McCutcheon, when the, the, the Giants didn't want to make that move, then they were going to go into 2018 with the same core. But now, I don't know if that's the case anymore. I don't know. and I, I don't know how much of what happened this week was overreported or underreported because I've seen... Uh, some folks since then come out and say, well, maybe it wasn't uh, as imminent as as uh, people were led to believe uh, on Thursday. Hmm. To me, it, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense uh, in that I, I don't think the Pirates have any pressure to make a move. Um, they, they can pick the player they think they want, and it, they, they have no reason not to say, well, we can just go into the season with Cole, and that's fine. So I, I don't see there being any reason for the Pirates to move their timetable up to make a deal happen. If, if they're going to get the deal they want, then they'll get the deal they want. And if they don't, I don't think they will. And I, I don't see that, that, that paradigm really changing much. I, I think the Pirates are in a position where they don't have to trade Garrett Cole. They'll have plenty of opportunities to trade Garrett Cole in the future if they want to. There's plenty of other teams besides the New York Yankees that would probably be interested in a player like Garrett Cole. And uh, I just don't see any reason for the Pirates to to change from that stance. And everything that I've seen that's been reported that involves specific players is that they really want Gliber Torres mm -hmm. to be a part of this deal. And to, to be honest, I don't see them having a – there isn't a real big reason to make it if he's not. I, I, I just – and, and uh, the Yankees don't seem to want to give him up, and they don't seem to want to pay one of the free agent pitchers that's on the market. And maybe that is what – you know, I guess finally tips the scale somewhere is that oh maybe somebody else signs you Darvish or Jake Arrieta and all of a sudden the the amount of leverage that the Pirates have over the situation changes a little bit. But right now I don't I don't feel like anything structurally has changed that would make the Pirates far more likely to make a trade this week than they were last week. You tweeted something that I thought was interesting too about the the Yankees' apparent desire to get Garrett Cole off the Pirates' hands. The Yankees play in a ballpark where fly balls aren't treated very nicely. <laughs> they tend to sail out of that ballpark. And I know it's just half of their games, but they also play at Fenway Park quite a bit. They play in Toronto in the division. That's also a hitter's yard for the most part. Garrett Cole really struggled with giving up the fly balls last year. And not to say that he can't adjust or maybe throw more breaking pitches or get on board with, uh, with some new approach to pitching. But uh, for me, he's uh, at the low ebb of his value right now, isn't he? Yeah, and that's the one thing. Like, yeah, I, I don't think this pursuit makes a lot of sense to me from the Yankees' end of yeah. things. Um, I, I, don't, I don't quite understand it. I mean, they did draft him out of high school. They did want him. Uh, they have wanted him. And I think maybe that's, that is one of the reasons why you're seeing so much of this talk centered around the Pirates and Yankees is that the Yankees seem to have placed an outside, outsized value on Garrett Cole as compared to... Uh, maybe what other teams see, but I just don't, I don't think it's a particularly good fit. And I, we've seen firsthand in players like Yvonne Nova, what the pirates have been able to do by getting players out of Yankee stadium and bringing them to PNC park. And then you look at Garrett Cole's numbers at PNC park and you're going to project them 
to happen in Yankee Stadium. And hey, man, I, I don't, I don't see it. I, I just don't. And I, I don't think it's a. If I was the Yankees, I wouldn't be trading their top prospects with Garrett Cole. Like I, I just wouldn't. I, I don't think it makes much sense for them. Which is another reason why I'm a bit skeptical that this trade is is all about to happen. I, I just don't quite see it from either end. Well. Yeah, that one snuck up on me. I didn't really think that there was going to be heavy Garrett Cole trade talk this offseason. Maybe next offseason, but the Pirates still have him for, what, three more years uh, under a reasonable, a very reasonable two. salary, even if yeah, – um, sorry, go ahead. Two, two years. Two years. 18 and 19. Yeah. Okay, never mind. I thought it was three. It is two. Yeah. And, uh, well, yeah, right, because he came up in 2013. I always forget about that that half season. So there you have it. We will find out. I was surprised by that news. Not surprised so much to see that Ian Cole, the other Cole in the equation, was scratched on Thursday night. The Penguins telegraphed their move on Wednesday at practice, Allen, when they played Jamie, Jamie Alexiak, their new acquisition from the Stars, on the right side with <clears throat> excuse me, Matt Hunwick and had Ian Cole paired up with Sergei Gonchar in kind of a fictional fourth pairing there. So it wasn't like they were trying to hide it or anything. We know that Ian Cole has been shopped this year. We know there is interest in the pending unrestricted free agent who makes $2.1 million this season. But do you think the, the Penguins are, are overplaying this hand? Are they, uh, are they just fed up with, with Ian Cole? What do you think is your read on the situation? Because for me, um, I, I think there are performance aspects here, but um, I also know that if he wasn't in the last year of his contract, I don't think they'd be treating him like this either. Yeah, and I, I just think that a good part of it is that there's only so many pieces that Jim Rutherford can really look at and say, "Well, this is something that we could get, we could move. If, mm -hmm. if we have to make a trade somewhere, this is something that that could go." And and the fact that Ian Cole is on the last year of his contract, as opposed to a guy like Olimana or a guy like Brian Dumoulin, I think it makes it makes that a lot easier deal to make happen. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't, I think the, I think one of the problems with Ian Cole is that Ian Cole was never quite as good as people thought he was <laughs> after the Penguins got him. And now he's, he's playing more like himself than, than he was. And, you know, it's just about expectations. I think a lot of it, you know, he's a third pairing defenseman. I think that's what he's been for most of his career. I, I, think the Penguins tried to make him into more than that, and I don't think it worked particularly well. And I don't think he's a bad third-pairing defenseman. In fact, he, I think he might be one of their better third-pairing defensemen. It's just, you know, if they're going to make a trade, he's a, he's a piece that makes sense to move, but he also is a perfectly capable defenseman that they could keep and be fine with. I just think that there's a limited number of those that Jim Rutherford has as far as chess pieces go that, that he could say, well, this one could go, that one could go. Um, you know, the, the, the nature of the contracts and the salary cap has them fairly boxed in um, from making, you know, too many moves. And they're going to have to drop some salary if they want to uh, add a player, obviously, and Cole's $2.1 million cap hit does make him a candidate in that way, as Alan alluded to. Well, I also think, Alan, that Justin Schultz being in and out of the lineup this year, he's out with a lower body injury right now. Earlier in the year, um, he was out for nearly 10 games. So Cole, I believe, and Justin Schultz as well, are, they're better together. But I, I think Schultz lifts Cole's game more than vice versa. So that's uh, led to uh, a shuffle around the, the lineup for Cole. And the, the Penguins, and Mike Sullivan openly has said that they've been disappointed with uh, how things have worked out on the right side of their D. They're hoping that Alexiak, even though he's a left-handed shot, uh, but is comfortable playing the right side, can alleviate some of that. I think part of that is uh, a disappointment in, in Matt Hunwick. Not that they'll say it out loud, but I believe they thought that Hunwick could play the right side, and it doesn't appear like he's very comfortable defending the rush. I think I've noticed that more than anything. So what's your assessment of Matt Hunwick before I let you go? Because... He appears to be the linchpin because if they didn't spend that money on him, then they could roll Ian Cole out there. But they committed three years, $2.25 million each to Hunwick. So for me, it's also trying to give him the best opportunity to succeed as well. To me, I think it's just a compounding of errors, right? And that if you look at Ian Cole and Matt Hunwick and on a different front that we've covered many times before, Ryan Reeves, you're looking at guys that are third pair 
fourth line kind of players and you put their salaries together. It's like $6 million. <laughs> yeah. You, you just can't have that in a salary cap league. You can't have bottom pair defensemen making over $2 million a season. You just can't. And I, I don't know if the Penguins thought that Matt Hummel could be more than that. Like they seem to think that Ian Cole could be more than that, but he's not, he hasn't played like he is. And you know, if you can have a third pairing defenseman that you can shelter a little bit that provides uh, some puck movement, and some offense, that's fine. But it's got to be cheap because this is a team with a lot of high end talent that that doesn't come cheaply. And uh, I just don't see uh, how it, it would it's going to work with that amount of salary tied up in in players that aren't performing in a in a top four role on defense. Well, there you have it. The Penguins are spending. The, I believe, fourth most money on their defense core in the NHL with Chris Letang thrown in. It's not that bad, but also considering who they're paying up front, Crosby and Malkin, uh, then you start to, to wonder, is it a little bit too much? And in the case of, of Matt Humwick, it could pan out. He still has two and a half more seasons to make that deal look good. But as for right now, yeah, they're, they're trying to maximize impact and they pick up Alexiak, who makes less than a million. So they're hoping that that can be... I don't know if Justin Schultz is the ceiling here for Alexiak, but maybe he can be a productive defender at the very least for them, more so than he was in Dallas. Thanks, Alan. I really appreciate the time, and have a great Christmas. We'll talk to you later. You do the same. That's Alan Saunders of, well, he writes for Pirates Prospects. He writes for Pittsburgh Sports Now, covering Pitt primarily, but he's always in tune with every subject. And we know, of course, that he runs Pittsburgh Hockey Digest, berghockey.com, covering everything short of the Penguins here in the Pittsburgh area. And I'm happy to team up with that website to call Peters Township High School Hockey on Facebook Live. So it's a great website, and I'm totally biased in that way, but it is worth your look, berghockey.com. When I return here on River's Edge, pgh.com, I'll bring Brian Crawford in, my engineer, and of course, uh, the voice of River Talk. We'll talk top sports stories of 2017. We'll see what he has to say in just a little bit. The Double O Bar, Grant Avenue, Millville, Pennsylvania, reminding you that you're listening to the River's Edge Radio Network. Back inside Mr. Small's Theater, high atop the hill in Millville, Pennsylvania. It's a gloomy December Friday, at least so far. This is the type of day that makes Brian and Crawford hate the, uh, the winter season. That's true. And yeah. winter has officially begun, I, by the way. I yesterday. will say, though, at least it's not freezing cold out. So that, yeah, that's it's one of the two. Degrees, yeah, one of the so. two things that I, I hate about winter is not present. So <laughs> temperature and, and darkness being the other. What's the other one? Well, those are the two big ones. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the snow either, or or I don't know. Just or Christmas or New Year's. You hate all. No, of them. I love New Year's actually. Well, New yeah, Year's is my so, favorite holiday. Wow, we my agree on that. New Year's that's Eve my favorite actually. Holiday yeah. Too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I remember that last year it's we a were fresh actually. Start. Yeah. yeah, we were talking about that. So it's well, it's a fresh start, and it's also also the death of the old year. Yeah, you can put so. that in the past and, and yeah. wipe your shoes on it if you want. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we're off to a nice start here. Yeah. Do we connect in another way, Brian? What's your top sport sports story of twenty seventeen? My top sports story in twenty seventeen is when Barcelona Football Club closed down and went on strike in support of the independence movement I didn't in see Catalonia. That. Yeah. When did this happen? Uh, it happened, they, they had a national, it was a while ago. After I remember the, the movement, yeah. Yeah, right. it was right after the initial vote, the uh, referendum that was deemed illegal by the Spanish government and the uh, Catalonian unions and, and workforce decided to go on strike and the football club joined in on that strike. How about that? Barcelona. Yeah, that's a... Well, that's a big brand in the sports world if you're not familiar with soccer. Yeah, they're right up there with uh, Real Madrid and Manchester United and Man City these days. So, okay, I didn't even know that. So you just taught me something. I didn't realize that even happened. It's a big deal, and actually, I don't know if you've been following... Catalonian politics. I don't know why you would. Not entirely but, closely. But yeah, I have, but I have because I, I, I listen to a lot of international <laughs> news. And so basically, it, it was a really crazy thing. So there was this, there's this independence movement, and there's been this this independence movement that's been going on for a long time, and it's always been kind of split where the people stand on it. And people who were staying, it, wanted to stay in Spain, seemed to uh, get their way most of the time. But then... Uh, they had this vote, and Spain deemed it illegal, and instead of letting the people vote and then saying, yeah, it doesn't count because it's illegal, 
Instead, they decided to send in national police forces to quash the vote. They were pulling people out of polling locations, shooting civilians with rubber bullets. Oof. And then they dissolved the government in Barcel in, uh, in Catalonia, mm -hmm. controlled it from Madrid, put up new elections, and the independence parties won again. And now the movement for independence has been strengthened f because of the response from Madrid. So it, it's a very interesting uh, dilemma that's going on in Spain, and I, I've been following it because, it, to me, it's fascinating. You may have a new country, a new country. Yeah, yeah very soon. It's been a little while since we had we've had one, and especially one in Europe, it's fractured off from one of the real traditional countries. Yeah, in Europe or, or anywhere. But yeah, okay. So you keep an eye on that story, and there's the tie in between sports and real yeah. life, and uh, not just popular culture, but in culture yeah. generally. So thanks for that. What are your thoughts on? For instance, the Steelers play in Houston on Christmas Day. The NBA traditionally blows it out on Christmas Day. They've tried to own that holiday. I think the NFL is trying to push back in recent years. The Steelers played on Christmas last year, I think, too, against the Ravens in a, in a tremendous game. Meanwhile, the NHL, not only do they not play on Christmas Day, they mandate that Christmas Eve is off, the day after Christmas is off, no practices, no nothing. And you can't make a trade in the week surrounding Christmas. There was oh. a trade freeze kicked in uh, that's been in the NHL for several years now. That's why Rutherford made the deals on Tuesday mm -hmm. uh, because he couldn't make them until I believe the 28th is when that trade wow. freeze goes away. So which way would you go if you were a sports league? I, I always, as if I were an employer, I always like to give my employees off and let them enjoy time with their families. I think mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. But it, then again, it is the entertainment business, so it's a little bit different in that regard because, you know, you're making a lot of money. I know I'm going to have to work on Christmas Day, but my job is, is pretty, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't need to be open on Christmas Day. I don't know that it needs to be open, but at the same time, you do have all of these people off work, and it is uh, the prime time to get eyeballs to the television. So I guess my personal feelings, I, I wish they were off. I would rather go the NHL mm -hmm. route, but I do understand the business side of it and, and why you would want to have games on those days. The only thing that I don't... I don't know if it's totally appropriate. What if you don't celebrate Christmas? What if it doesn't mean anything to you? I know that it's become more of a secular holiday than a religious holiday these days. People just celebrate it because it's Christmas and um, and, and it's on the 25th and people typically are off. So it's almost like a self-perpetuating cycle. So people typically do, you know, get together with family, whether they are Christian or not. Then you have uh, Jewish folks celebrate Hanukkah, which just ended a, a couple of days ago, too. So whenever you mix church and state in that way, that's when I get a little nervous. But Well, you're not really mixing church and state. You've got a private organization who's making a decision. It's not the government Correct. coming down and telling you I, you I have agree. to be off. Yeah, not literally church and state. But yeah, it, it's just a little curious to me that we would even make a deal out of it. I, um, I, I can see is, it both ways. I can see it both ways. If you're going to close down for Christmas, then I think it would be fair if someone is of a different faith to allow them to have a day that's a religious day of, of mm -hmm. their choosing to have off as well. I mean, you can't go crazy. Some of the religions have so many religious days that they would want off that you can't allow people to just never show up to work. But, you know, maybe you have your big few. Uh, if you want, if you are going to give it to Christian people, then I think mm -hmm. you should make those accommodations for other religions. But... On the flip side, if you're going to make accommodations and everyone in your company is a Christian and, and they're not going to show up to work, you can't operate. So <laughs> that's true, right? How do you how do you stay open yeah, at that point? It's, it's a good uh, point. You have to make a concession one way or the other from one side of it or the other. Selfishly, Brian, I'm happy that the NHL does it this way. Yeah, because I don't oh, have to sure. work on Christmas Day. I don't have to work on New Year or Christmas Eve. I don't have to work on the day after Christmas, Boxing Day, as they'd call it over yes. in uh, in Britain. I think Canada does a little bit of Boxing Day. They too. do a Boxing Day yeah. too. Yeah, is it the same day? Yeah. I know, okay. 26th, uh, maybe Australia. So it's like a British Empire. That's what I was just thinking. Yeah, one of those of Commonwealth there. type of deals. Uh -huh. yeah. well, no doubt about it. Well, if you were uh, listening to the last segment, and Brian, this is media in a nutshell these days, we've already had reports this morning on Garrett Cole both um, throwing cold water on the possible trade talks, and now we're seeing from Jim Bowden on, um, on, on Twitter, Jim Bowden of, uh, I believe he's on Sirius XM Radio. Yes, he is, the former GM of a couple of teams, in fact. He's saying that it will happen, Garrett Cole to the Yankees, and it's just a matter of time. So we've gone from it will happen to maybe it won't happen to it will happen in the matter of 
five or six hours this morning. That's fun to try to keep track of. Well, the thing is, is like uh, I understand the one one you said was a coach, right? Saying that or was, uh, was or general manager. General manager but, here. Yeah. Well, he's in the media now. But, oh, he's in yeah. the media. So, uh-huh. That's my one thing that bothers me. If you're in the media and you don't know, then then why? Act well, like it you seems do. like he knows. The problem okay. is you're talking to different sources. Yeah. And uh, Mark Feinsand and John Heyman earlier today who were saying that maybe it won't happen. They're talking to other sources. And that's the issue with, with journalism in this way yeah. is uh, when you're dealing with unnamed sources, sometimes they can have different motivations, right? Maybe it's the Yankees leaking this out to make the Pirates nervous. Oh, the trade's off now. We better sweeten our offer. Or yeah. We better ask for less. So that's always that's been my concern whenever I've talked to to player agents or any other like team sources. Are they trying to angle me in a certain way? Yeah. And then you're not really being a good journalist if you just print it willy nilly. Exactly. I mean, you can say right who, that you you know undisclosed source or something. Yeah, you like can that. say yeah. that, but mm-hmm. you could also be being used. Is what I'm saying. Sure. As well, you're just being played, and that happens in politics too. You see it all the time. Leaks, and then you have to make the decision. Hopefully, with the help of an editor or someone else with your organization. What do I do with this? Is this enough to, to report or do I need to get a second source? Yeah. That's where that – typically you, you want a second source. That's why that comes into play because you can't just be pushed around by a single one. Do but you think like in the media – It's informal. It, it's all, you know – Well, do you think in the media nowadays uh, some maybe less responsible journalists don't look for that second source? Oh, because sure. Because they want to just be the first ones. Th- there's pressure to get content out, whether it be on Twitter. I think social media powers that hastiness. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also just competitiveness too. You want to have something and be the the person that fans go to, right? I've I've succumbed to that pressure in the past, and I try not to. But it's it's human nature. You want to do well on your job, and uh, so maybe you you fudge some things. Maybe you don't stick to a particular uh, ethic or, or or code in this case. But that's the thing about journalism too. It's more art than science. Uh-huh. There really is no yeah. There's a, a, a journalism ethics board in America. There's a journalism ethics standard, so to speak. But there is no hard and fast rule. So that that's always the challenge of this job. Anyway, Brian, thanks for the input. Always, I appreciate that. Brian Crawford, the host of River Talk and the Maestro at the River's Edge, and now the Metal Edge too. You can check out that with a harder edge to the music, no pun intended, that you're used to here on this station. Before I wrap it up today, and we'll just keep it here, we won't go to a a final break, I wanted to pay tribute to a role model of mine in the business, a guy that I got to meet a couple of times in covering the Pirates. Dick Enberg has passed away. Uh, Dick, who covered, I don't know how many different sports. That was always one of the reasons why I loved him, because he could go from thing to thing and he seemed like he was an expert on all of it. And that's part of the, uh, the reason why I try to keep my hands in various topics and be able to comment on them. Dick Enberg was 82 after a 60 year career. You know him by his uh, famous call of oh my after a big moment, whether it be US Open tennis or NFL football, the Super Bowl, Olympics, Final Fours. He called Angels baseball back in the 70s and 80s. Most recently, even at the age of, of 80 and 81 and 82, he got back into the day-to-day grind of baseball play-by-play with the San Diego Padres. And that's where I ran into him last year, last summer, or pardon me, two summers ago, 2016 summer, down at Petco Park in San Diego. Dick came in to do some opposing research, as every good play-by-play person does. You check out the uh, opposite team, maybe touch base with a couple of the key players. Dick wanted to talk to Andrew McCutcheon, and he did, but... As he was waiting for Andrew to, to, uh, to come to his locker, I struck up a conversation with him, and I'm glad I did. We got to talk tennis. I've always been a huge fan of, of Dick's tennis calls, and uh, we discussed whether certain players in tennis would be good baseball players. That was such a, a fun conversation to have with a legend, a Hall of Famer like Dick Enberg. I believe he said Roger Federer would make a good shortstop, and, and uh, Rafa Nadal might be uh, a good third baseman. I, I really enjoyed uh, that talk, and... Um, of course, as I mentioned, I'm not the only one in the sports media business to have an admiration for, uh, for Dick and all of his work on broadcasts, various uh, networks. He's basically done it all, and he did it all, and he was even doing a podcast. He adapted to the new media climate. That's what I admired about him, too. He was tweeting just as recently as last night about his favorite nicknames in sports. 
Um, it was reported, though, that he was found dead in his home by his wife in San Diego. So pour one out if you have anything left in your cup this morning for Dick Enberg. Oh, my, what a career indeed. And one of the real decent men in the business, too, as I found in just my short time here covering major league teams, not all the people that come off as great people on the air are actually great people, but Dick showed to me in our short conversation that he's a very gracious man just talking to, to some random guy in the Pirates Clubhouse and myself uh, about the, the convergence of tennis and baseball. That's when you know the passion for sports was real, and that's when you know the quality of the human being was real. So um, it, it was surreal last night to see that as I was wrapping up my Penguins coverage from PPG Paints Arena of Penguins Blue Jackets to see that news come across the wire. And uh, you can actually look back at some of Dick's recent tweets. He still had the enthusiasm. He's still doing interviews, podcasting. His Twitter handle, D-E, oh my. So he worked in his signature call into his handle as well. You know, you got to love Dick Enberg. If you love sports broadcasting, I think he was one of those rare personalities as well that wasn't polarizing. For instance, I think that Joe Buck is a tremendous broadcaster. He cracks me up. I think he's uh, really one of the top men in his field, one of the top people in his field, and uh, another person, in fact, who does multiple sports, and I admire him greatly for that. But a lot of people don't like Joe Buck. They think he's a smart ass, et cetera, et cetera. That's part of the reason why I like him. But Enberg was not that way. And even he took the time out of a busy career to co-author a book that really helped me as a young sportscaster in college called The Art of Sportscasting. I remember just reading his tips and his advice. And when a guy like that, if that statue has covered all these world-class events, when he's giving you tips, yeah, you tend to listen a little bit more than you do to your professors in class. So thank you to my professors for assigning that. Thank you to Dick for being such a huge part of, of all of our lives as sports fans over the past, as I said, 60 years in the business. And um, what a man, what a broadcaster. Thank you for watching. Geek's Got Game, thank you for listening to the show as well. If you are checking us out on the live stream at riversedgepgh.com, you can find the podcast, speaking of podcasts, on the website, archive version. This has been Geek's Got Game, episode 101, and my final episode of the year. If you just tuned in this year in 2017, thank you very much for coming along. If you are a loyal listener and watcher, thank you even more. This is Matt Geiker reminding you that when the radio fades... You know life's moving fast. Have a tremendous Christmas if you do celebrate, and an awesome new year. I know all of us do as we turn the page over to 2018.